ascertain that the patient is the right candidate for the procedure. Then the next step is the radiological planning which will be discussed in this video. One should know exactly how much is the varus or valgus deformity, whether the deformity is in the tibia or femur or both, how much correction should be undertaken, are you going to correct in the tibia or femur or in both. The steps in radiological planning for high tibial osteotomy are, obtaining proper x-rays and analyzing them, radiological planning, intraoperative verification and finally obtaining a good result. A standing full-length x-ray, with the patient bearing weight on both the limbs is very crucial for planning for osteotomy. The x-ray source is positioned 10 feet away from the patient and a long cassette can be used. Or a cassette deck as shown in the image with an image processing software can also be used. The x-ray beam is centered on the knee and the exposure would be around 85 to 105 kilovolts. The x-ray image will always be downsized and to know the original measurements placement of a object with a known size is important. A metallic sphere is preferable as it casts a round shadow always. Here a metallic ball of 3 cm, which is embedded in a cloth velcro belt is tied around the lower third of thigh, in level with the bone in the sagittal section. The patient's patella should be facing forward and the anterior superior iliac spine should be at the same level. Any limb length discrepancy noted should be addressed by keeping planks under the shorter leg. A properly exposed scanogram should be examined for the central position of patella. The lateral tibial margin should cross the fibula at the widest part of fibula. There should be a one-third overlap of fibula by tibia. The distal femur and joint line should be clearly visible without any overlap. In planning we are concerned primarily with mechanical axes. Anatomical axis of a long bone is a line that divides the shaft into two halves. The mechanical axis of the femur connects the center of the femoral head and the center of the intercondylar notch. In the tibia it is a line connecting the center of the tibial articular surface with the center of the ankle joint. In femur the anatomical and mechanical axes are different with a 6 to 7 degrees variation. In tibia both are almost same with the anatomical axis being 3 to 4 mm medial to the mechanical axis. The mechanical axis of the entire lower limb, also called the McCulloch's line runs from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle joint. Under physiological conditions this line runs on an average of 4 mm medial to the center of the knee joint. When this line is displaced more than 10 mm laterally or more than 15 mm medially, then it is called a significant mechanical axis deviation. In this video we will consider the varus deformity primarily. Varus deformity could be produced by deformities in tibia or femur, erosion of medial joint, laxity of lateral ligament structures and following malunited and trarticular fractures. The mechanical axis deviation would indicate a significant varus, but to understand the origin of the varus, it is important to know and calculate these two measurements. Medial proximal tibial angle, shortened as MPTA and lateral distal femoral angle, shortened as LDFA. The MPTA, is the angle formed by the mechanical axis of the tibia with the tangential line to the tibial articular surface. Its normal value is 87 degrees with a deviation of 3 degrees. Any decrease in the value indicates that the origin of varus is from the tibia. The LDFA, is the angle formed by the mechanical axis of the femur with the tangential line to the distal femoral articular surface and once again it has the same value of 87 degrees. Any increase in this value indicates that the origin of varus is from the femur. Once the tibia is confirmed as the source of varus, the cause of the varus should be ascertained. It could be a medial joint erosion, it could be a metaphysial deformity. Loose lateral structures due to a previous ligament injury or stretching can cause lateral joint opening, aggravating the varus. Very rarely the varus can be contributed by a diaphysial deformity. In many cases, the metaphysial varus can be measured by calculating the tibial bone varus angle. It is the angle formed between the epiphysial axis, the line that is perpendicular to the line that connects the medial and lateral ends of the epiphysial scar line and then the mechanical axis of tibia. A TBVA more than 5 degrees indicates a metaphysial varus. HTO gives the best results if done for a metaphysial deformity as it corrects the deformity and restores normal morphology. It gives the best outcomes. On the other hand an HTO in a normal proximal tibial morphology can induce a new deformity even though unloading is achieved. It is important to understand the varus produced by lateral joint opening due to excess laxity of the lateral ligament structures. One should not correct this component of varus in bone. 
the joint line convergence angle is the angle between the tangentials to the distal femoral and distal tibial articular surfaces. Up to 2 degrees is normal. Any value more than that should be subtracted from the overall varus correction. Fujisawa point is a popular landmark for shifting the weight-bearing line, which was inferred from a retrospective series. It is not necessary to shift the weight-bearing line to Fujisawa point in all cases. Mostly we aim to achieve a 2 or 3 degree of valgus. To achieve that the weight-bearing line is shifted just lateral to the lateral tibial spine. But depending on the prevailing osteoarthritic changes, the weight-bearing line can be shifted further laterally to unload the medial compartment much more effectively. We know the deformity angles in degrees, but we need to know the size of opening wedge in millimeters to complete the osteotomy. We have few methods, which will help us derive the exact height of the osteotomy wedge in millimeters. The Miniachi method is the one which is popularly used. In a weight-bearing x-ray, the existing weight-bearing line is drawn. The correction point is chosen according to the existing osteoarthritic changes. And the hinge point is also marked on the lateral tibial cortex. The new weight-bearing line is drawn through the correction point. The new weight-bearing line should be of the same length as the old weight-bearing line. The distal end of the new line is connected to the hinge point and then onto the center of the ankle joint. The angle made at the hinge point is noted. At this stage if there is a soft tissue varus, any JLCA more than 2 degrees should be subtracted from this angle measurement. A triangle with the hinge point is the apex with the resultant angle is drawn. The base of the triangle gives the measurement for the opening wedge. Since the X-rays are downsized it is important to calibrate at this stage. Now, the metallic sphere is measured and the calibration ratio is found out and is applied to the measurement. Which gives the real life opening distance in millimeters. One can also use various softwares for radiological planning. But one should be aware of, plotting mistakes, intra-observer and inter-observer variations. Another pitfall one should be aware is the intra-articular deformity of tibia, as following a mall united medial tibial fracture or a blunt's disease resulting in a pagoda tibia. Here the joint surfaces are incongruent and the patient walks with severe varus thrust. Here an intra-articular osteotomy to lift only the medial tibial condyle is appropriate. Doing HTO in this situation can result in a teeter effect with a poor result. Another pitfall, would be to miss the varus deformity due to soft tissue laxity. This would typically result in an overcorrection as the soft tissue laxity collapses once the knee goes for valgus. In major corrections, over 12 mm, the resultant MPTA angles should be calculated. An MPTA of 94 degrees would be acceptable in a correction. Anything more would result in joint shear and can result in poor long-term outcomes. Distributing the correction across both femur and tibia, in a double-level osteotomy would prevent joint obliquity. The tibia normally slopes down posteriorly by 7 to 9 degrees. Ideally one should not change the tibial slope during an HTO. However one must remember that the opening wedge osteotomy has a tendency to increase the slope and a closing wedge osteotomy has a tendency to decrease the slope. In a ACL deficient knee, the slope should not be increased and in a PCL deficient knee the slope should not be decreased. Not only patient selection, but careful radiological planning is crucial for the success of high tibial osteotomy. One should always resist a tendency to eyeball or depend on intraoperative checks like diathermy cable or long rods. Parallax and positioning errors can lead to significant mistakes. Always rely on your preoperative planning values. HTO is a procedure of perfections. It starts from taking perfect x-rays to careful execution. Thanks for your attention. Music